Well, good morning and welcome to the Rivers online worship experience this morning. Uh, my name is Dean Ward and I serve as the lead pastor of the River Church. And I am so grateful that you have chosen to join in with us here this morning. Now, I, I just want to start. I know some of you may be confused because I say I only wear Steeler jerseys on the game days and you know they're not playing this Sunday. Uh, today, probably when you're watching this, but uh, we're filming on Thursday and they're playing Thursday. So you got to support. Um, and <laughs> I'm wearing uh, what my uh, film person called a real Steelers jersey. Well, I think they're all real Steelers and I'm grateful to be able to celebrate uh, my love for our team and um, I'm grateful that you are here with us. Hey, I want to just let you know, if you struggle with uh, how early it gets dark during these months, I just, I just want to let you know, in less than two weeks, less than two weeks, December 21st, the days start to get longer. You start to get more daylight. So uh, depression-free living can be yours. It's just a few weeks away, and I'm so glad that you have chosen to join in with us for that bit of encouragement. Hey, also want to let you know, I hope that you were able to watch the message last week where we shared uh, the design renditions of the renovations and the upgrades that we're going to be doing at this building. I hope that uh, you take a look at those, and um, I had mentioned to you in the offering slide that came on right before my sermon and in last week's sermon that we are raising money for our end of year giving initiative. Uh, we have several parts of that initiative that are going to bless and help others from our benevolence fund to the 10,000 meals that we're packing this Sunday to send to areas of distress all over the world um, and also supporting our Christ's birthday observance and those funds that will go to missions there. Uh, but we are raising uh, $100,000 for this project, for these renovations, along with some additional funds that we have already um, put away. Um, we are going to be over halfway there to where we need to go. So I want to invite you to just prayerfully consider what the Lord might be asking you to do and how he might be asking you to give as 2023 comes to an end to his work here in 15068 and especially to uh, the renovations and upgrades that we're going to be doing to our new home that we'll be moving into in 2024. Um, I just ask if you would prayerfully consider what the Lord might be asking you to do. So we are beginning today our sermon series uh, for Christmas. And every year I love our Christmas series because it really helps focus us during these times leading up to Christmas uh, in a very meaningful way, uh, focusing on Jesus, uh, our Savior, and his birth and the celebration of such and I want to uh, just let you know, this series is just simply called With Us. And it is a series that's going to focus on one verse. This verse in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Now, it'll focus on many verses, but this will be the one verse throughout the next few weeks that we begin each of our messages in. Matthew says, he records this verse in Matthew 1.23. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew is recording the pronouncement of the soon coming Messiah, and this Emmanuel, that will be God with us. And as we begin this series, I, I want to thank Pastor Craig Groeschel of Life Church for his resources. Um, there's a lot that he does that helps advance the kingdom, 
and this series, this message had been strongly influenced by him and his uh, words and teaching, and I just want to thank him for his kingdom-mindedness and how he is able to bless all over the world through sharing of resources, and um, thank you. Um, so it's easy to believe that we experience God the best on the mountaintops, that we experience his presence and his love and his goodness, and that we feel closest to God when we are on those mountaintop experiences. I was visiting with a pastor friend of mine recently, and he said, how are you doing? And we hadn't visited for about a year. And I just recounted where we were, that we were in a really good place with our children, with our grandchildren, with my in-laws, with our marriage, with our church, my relational. I was just celebrating. Uh, man, it's it's really at a at a good place right now. And it's easy during those times to feel like, oh, God is so good to me and God is so near to me. But if you want anything to steal that joy away from you, just head into Christmas season <laughs> with all the stress, with all the distractions. Um, you know, it's easy to believe that God is with us on the mountaintops when things are going great. When we get a raise, when our team wins, when our kids sleep through the night for the first time. Our, my sister's favorite, when she gets a parking spot all the way close to the front entrance. She loves it. She's a pro at it. And she is convinced that that's one of the ways that God expresses his love toward her. I'm a little envious because that doesn't always happen to me, but <laughs> that's for another sermon. But it's more difficult to sense God's love and his presence and his goodness in the valleys. But when your team loses to a 2-10 and 10 team, like we experienced this past week, <laughs> when you're alone, when you're scared, when you're hurting, when you experience bad news, when you're struggling in your marriage, when your kids are struggling. The valley represents those places where we battle, where we experience loneliness and desperation. But, but I want to help us understand that those times in the valley and those those places when we're in the valley, they can be our most treasured places of growth. They can build our faith. They can help us experience God in different ways in the valley than we do on the mountaintop. I love this statement. We may enjoy God on the mountaintops, but we get to know him intimately in the valleys. I, I want to uh, just spend a little bit of time in Psalm 84, verses 5 through 7. Now, this is the kind of psalm that when you read it, uh, you may just plow right on through and not give much thought to it whatsoever, but uh, there's some real uh, wealth and helpful information and some things that I want to draw out from these few verses. Uh, verse 5 begins, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains cover it with pools. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Now, uh, this, this verse talks about the Valley of Baca. Now, uh, this is most likely uh, reflected upon the, the Baca tree, which is a tree that oozes sap. And this sap oozes profusely where it looks like the tree is weeping. 
there's a valley that the psalmist is referring to where these trees would be and this valley it's desert country in this valley there are thorns and wild animals and vipers there's danger and all throughout scripture we see that it's nearly impossible to travel through a valley without facing trouble or hardship. The Valley of Baca is also known as the Valley of Tears or the Valley of Weeping or the Valley of Loss. Many times we go through valleys in our own lives and we really struggle in them. Sometimes we lose our way and lose ourselves. And so for this message, I would like to speak to those of us who find ourselves in a really rough place right now, in a really desperate valley, in a place where we're not sure that we are going to be able to make it through and we're losing our way. So I want to just um, jump into verse 5. The psalmist begins by saying, Blessed are those whose strength is in you. Now, I I know that uh, sometimes uh, listening and watching to our uh, videos, there are people that really don't know God personally. And I want to thank you for joining in and, and listening and May the Lord use this time to draw you toward Him. But the reality is, if you don't have the Lord in your life, then the truth is that what you have is all you have. The strength that you have is the strength that you have. But for followers of Jesus, when we find ourselves exhausted, when we find ourselves in that desperate place where we say, I just can't take anymore. I don't think I can make it through. We have the blessing, the privilege of being able to tap into strength that is not our own. We are able to tap into the strength beyond ourselves. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, Lord. Now notice the verse doesn't say, blessed are those who make it on their own. (laughs) Blessed on those, uh, blessed are those who are fiercely independent. Blessed are those who are able to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and press on. That's not what the verse says. But we live in a culture that values independence to a point where we almost idolize it. We seek not to be dependent on God. We seek not to be dependent on anyone else. Somehow we think that's a badge of honor. But scripture teaches that we are created to live as individuals dependent on God and in community dependent on others. And when we live our lives that way, we tap into strength that is beyond ourselves. When you are weak, his strength is made perfect in our weakness, Scripture declares. What joy comes for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Blessings are those, blessed are those who have their minds set toward God. They have their minds set on following and pursuing God. This pilgrimage to Jerusalem that represented the city of peace, the city of hope, the city of Zion. Scripture tells us, in Colossians, to set our mind on things above, not on things below. I love the way Philippians chapter 4 
calls us out when it says whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is excellent, whatever is praiseworthy, think about these things. Can I just draw our attention to this truth? (laughs) What we think about matters. What we allow our mind to think and focus on matters. Do you ever wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep? (laughs) I want to invite you, when you find yourself there, to think differently. I tried this last night. I I fell asleep in my recliner and about 1.30 in the morning I crawled into bed and I was laying there and I was tossing and turning and couldn't quite drift off. And and then I I, I just decided to say to myself, I have the peace of God. Like all those things that were interfering with my mind and keeping me from sleeping and rest, uh, they were cluttering and, and crowding out so much. And I just said, I have the peace of God. And I said, He is with me. I can rest in Him. My mind is at rest. Whenever we pause and work on getting our thinking in line with the truth of Scripture and the truth of who God is, Emmanuel, God with us, it can make all the difference. Your current situation, it may have you smack dab in the middle of the valley. I just want to ask you to fix your mind on God. Your heart may be anxious, but if your mind is fixed on God, your heart will come into rhythm. Your soul may be aching, but when your mind is fixed on God, your soul finds peace. Your emotions may be racing, But when your mind is fixed on God, there is a calm and a peace. You may think, I have too much to do. My marriage is in a bad place. My in-laws are coming for Christmas. (laughs) I have to pay for Christmas. I want to invite you to fix your mind on God. Allow Him to bring you peace in the midst of the darkness, peace in the midst of the valley. I love the way verse 6 says, As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. We may be in the valley, but please know this, the valley is not our destination. We are passing through the valley. We are not staying in the valley. Leon Ivey Jr. declared in his Grammy Award winning winning hit, Gangsta's Paradise, he starts his song like this. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Okay, please, Dean, don't ever do that again. What, you don't recognize that? Perhaps if you knew his stage name of Coolio, you would remember that song. (laughs) I'm sorry. I just, I practice that. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And it's one of those things that you have to go all in. You can't just be timid while you do it. I, I love the way the psalmist tells us that when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he declares, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God, you are with me. God's presence helps us through those dark times, help us us through those dark valleys. Now, many times we just want out. We don't want to go through anything. We just want God to pick us up and remove us from the pressure, from the stress, from the anxiety, 
from the conflict. We just want removed from it. But the way is through, not out. My sophomore year of college, uh, I was away uh, down in Virginia going to school. And I remember feeling some stuff uh, coming up to early December at college I'd never experienced before. I, I, I was sensing some pressure, uh, some depression, some uh, darkness in my soul. Like I, I never, I'm like, what, what is this? And, and I was called my mother. Uh, that's when you had to go to the payphone in the hallway. And uh, there were only two of them for a hundred of us on the hallway. And you could have these very private conversations in the midst of the hallway at our dorm. But I remember talking to my mom and I said, Mother, I just, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm struggling here. And she said, Dean, I want you to promise me something. And I said, what's that? She goes, I want you to promise me that you won't hurt yourself. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? And she said, well, Dean, more, more people are prone to despair and depression and to, given the thoughts of hurting themselves leading up to Christmas and during the holiday season than any other time. And she said, Dean, promise me this. Promise me you won't do anything that would be hurtful to you. And I said, oh, okay, I, I, I make you that promise. And I just want to ask you, if you are finding yourself in such a dark place that you just want out, even if it all involves hurting yourself, I, I just want to ask you to make a promise to me that, that you won't hurt yourself that you'll reach out, that you'll call 911, that you'll reach out to a friend, that you'll begin to talk through what you're experiencing with a trusted friend because we can make it through what we are experiencing if we don't give up. For many, the valley is the pathway to the place of peace. Don't give up. I want us to just engage with this video uh, that's just simply called With Us. From high above us, God sees. From far beyond us, God hears. From his eternal distant home, God loves. He sees all people in all places. And it's easy for us to imagine that he does so from this perspective. High, beyond, distant. But then, Christmas. It appears without earthly fanfare or celebration. The cry of this child screams that the same God who is above and beyond and distant has not only come close to us, but that he's indeed with us. So what if the name Emmanuel means what it means? Today, now, with us, the manger proclaims that the very presence of God is now present with us. In the mundane, in the uncertainty, in the mystery that lies beyond our understanding or explanation, God himself is with us in our joy and our happiness. He's with us in our sadness and our brokenness. He celebrates in the light with us, and he holds us in the dark with faithful and secure arms. What if the name Emmanuel means what it means? Christmas not only begs that we ask that question, but also provides the answer that our hearts have been longing for all along. Can this possibly be? Yes, it can. And it is God with us. Emmanuel, 
and he's closer than our wildest dreams can ever imagine. Oh, come, oh, come, So I wanted to explain why I was sitting in that place because uh, that's kind of a little cave kind of area that feels very like the walls are coming in around you and thing life is uh, just getting much smaller than we want it to in, in that setting. And so I wanted to sit there and film today uh, the first part of the message. And then I wanted to uh, share other parts of our church building at 273 Chester Drive in Lower Borough. We have filmed extensively outside and in the large gathering spaces. Uh, but I wanted to film in a few nooks and crannies, a few places you might not be aware of. So uh, that first space was that. And then I wanted to film in one of the larger classrooms uh, with a more lighter backdrop with a, with a more festive you'll notice palm branches i mean who who doesn't like palm trees in the middle of december and we thought it would be uh just a little more appropriate to wrap this message up in a more uh visually pleasing setting um, because i want to point out that in the midst of our darkness that we can grow closer to God and more dependent on Him and stronger than we ever thought possible. And when we do that, something fascinating happens. God begins to redeem our brokenness. God begins to rescue us and bring about good through the pain. Uh, my brother-in-law, who I've shared his journey with you over the past three years, um, you know, found himself in a very desperate, dark place. And three years later now, he is using the heartbreak that he has experienced in his life over the past 15 years. And he is now teaching a ministry that helps others who are experiencing heartbreak and desperateness because he tapped into this. Your place of pain can become your place of purpose. And I want to just encourage you in the midst of the darkness that you might be navigating heading into this Christmas season to just hold on and, and, and ask God, to redeem this pain. I've never been able to empathize with people in their grief and loss to the extent that I can now, that I have experienced it so deeply and profoundly in my life. And our place of pain can become our place of purpose. I love the way Paul declares this in 2 Corinthians chapter one. In essence, he says, hey, the, the struggle and the pain that you've gone through, you've been comforted by God. And now because of that, you can comfort others because of what you have experienced. He says it this way, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the suffering of Christ, <laughs> now that's, that's, do you remember Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble? <laughs> Paul is echoing that when he's saying, hey, we we share abundantly in the suffering of Christ. Amen to that. Anybody experienced that lately? But Paul shows us how that can be redeemed. And when he says, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. I also love how verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 2 reminds us of God's faithfulness when we need deliverance from those desperate places. 
It says he, meaning Jesus, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. I mean, that's the trifecta. God has delivered us. He will deliver us. And he continually delivers us. It's a great verse to hang on to. Verse 6 goes, As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Now you may say, well, what, what, what's that about? Well, the, the valley of Baca, it's a desert, right? Uh, and so what they do when they're going through there is they dig pools or they dig wells. The King James Version says, make it a well. And when you are in a dry place, dig a well. <laughs> now, in this metaphor, digging a well, it, it's the act of creating space for God to show up and surprise you with His goodness, provision, and providence through His presence. Now, Let's put ourselves back, you know, 3,000 years ago when this psalm was written. Uh, you didn't have the municipal authority of um, New Kensington to deliver water to your house for uh, about $40, $50 a month. You, you, didn't, you didn't have that convenience. You couldn't just go to a spigot and turn it on and there's water. Uh, water was a good thing. For those of us that complain when it rains where we wish we didn't live in western Pennsylvania because it's always overcast and rains so much. Well, in, in Scripture times, rain indicated God's blessing, His provision, God showing up in the midst of the dry, arid climate and bringing refreshing rain. And so when you're in a dry place, Dig a well, dig a small hole, a container to catch the rain. It's as though God says, hey, I want you to show me your faith and then I'll show you my faithfulness. I want you to trust and believe that I will come through for you. And guess what? I will come through for you. Buried in this passage of pain is the promise, if you dig it, God will fill it. There are many promises that we have to hold on to whenever we find ourselves in those dry places. There are many ways that we dig uh, wells, that we make puddle areas that when rain comes, when God's faithfulness shows up, He fills. In James chapter 4, it says, If you draw near me, I will draw near you. These passages indicate our calling to move toward God, our calling to take action as we wait on the Lord. If you seek me, you will find me. If you make room for me, I will reveal myself to you. God rarely reveals himself when we are rushed. Uh, you know, Moses in the burning bush, he didn't just drive by the burning bush at 80 miles an hour and say, oh, wow, there's a bush on fire and not being consumed. Oh, it's a great Instagram moment. Let me get a photo and post it. No. God invited him to just be still before him, to take off his sandals and, hey, we're going to stay here a while. Slow down. When I was on my way, I hopped in the car to come to preach uh, today, and I got in the car and I turned it on, and the, the radio was so loud, I'm like, oh, that's overwhelming. So I, I turned, uh, my wife drove the car before I did. She, she loves to listen to the radio very loudly in the car. So I turned the radio off and I'm driving and I come to a stoplight and this notion of being still before the Lord just kind of crossed my mind. And I'm like, okay, God, 
So at the stoplight, I just closed my eyes. I took a deep breath in. I was still before him. And even in that moment, I sensed God's goodness, his presence, his faithfulness. Being still before the Lord opens our souls up for him to show up in ways that are very unique. I opened my eyes and saw that the car ahead of me was well gone, like <laughs> way ahead of me. Um, I started to move forward and I realized that the driver behind me was not from uh, New Kensington because he didn't honk his horn at me. So I knew, I knew he wasn't a local. <laughs> when we are still before the Lord, we are literally preparing for God's presence to show up. God never says, you won't go through the valley. But you never have to go through the valley alone. So in your life, if it's dark, if you're experiencing a storm, if you're navigating trouble, or if you're feeling weak, here's your light in the darkness, your peace in the storm, your joy in the trouble. He's your strength when you are weak. Here it is through Him, in and through Him. His presence makes all the difference. Praise Him before your prayer that you're asking God to help you with is answered. Enjoy Him on the mountain but get to know Him in the valley. Seek His strength. Fix your mind. Dig a well. I, I want to leave you with the uh, passage that I hold on to in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. David is writing and he says, it's a prayer to the Lord. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If you have never opened up your life to Christ. If you have tried to live your entire life in your own strength, if you've never come to a place where you've said, God, I need you, I, I want to invite you to give your life to Jesus Christ right now. Make that quantum shift in your life of opening your life up to Him, inviting Him in, seeking His forgiveness for the wrongs and transgressions that you have committed in the past, and allowing Him to bring the gift of life to you in all of its fullness. Because when you open your life to Christ... He embeds His Spirit in you, and His presence is with you always. Let's pray. Father, I come before you now just asking that anybody watching this video, hearing these words, that your Spirit maybe is moving on their heart to open their lives up to you. I pray that today, they would just simply call on your name through a simple prayer, declaring their need for you, their acceptance of you, and the desire to experience your grace, your love, and your forgiveness. For me, at a younger age, that prayer just sounded something like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I ask you now, to come into my life. Be with me. I ask that you would forgive me for my sin, my wrongs, my transgressions, my mistakes, those things that have separated me 
from your best plan for my life. I accept your free gift of life and salvation now. Thank you for adopting me into your family, and I will begin to live my life with you, following you. May your presence protect and be with me now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, I want to invite you, if you just made that declaration, inviting Christ to be your leader, your savior, your forgiver, um, I, I want you to reach out to us. You can email us at admin at goriverchurch.com. Uh, you can reach out to the church through a phone call, 724-33-RIVER, because we'd love to hear from you and encourage you on your journey. God bless you. Thank you for joining in with us today. And may you live this week aware of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. God bless you, everybody.